very warm manliest welcome to Greg Wells. Well, good morning, everybody. It is um, a great treat to be here. Um, I, I think m many of you know mainly this has actually been my home for 30 years until just very recently when my wife and I and my family relocated to the city as part of my new job with the city of Syracuse. Part of the deal for uh, taking a job on the senior staff of the mayor and working in City Hall is uh, you will live in the city of Syracuse. And uh, it has been a fun and exciting thing for us to do. Quite frankly, um, it was part of the draw for us at this stage in our lives of making such a big change in our lives. Um, and we haven't regretted it uh, one moment. Uh, of course, we've only lived in the city for about a month and a half right now. But, uh, I'm confident that the future is bright and I hope by the time we're done talking today that you'll, you'll feel very much the same way uh, about what's ahead for the city of Syracuse. I thought today, Lou, how much time do I have? What did you We're gonna walk out of here one minute to 12. <laughs> I, we have that long, really? As long as, you, as long as you can keep it up. Okay. So one minute before 12. Well, <laughs> I doubt I'll talk that long, but I hope that maybe uh, I can answer some questions and be glad to have dialogue with you about any matters you wanna put on the table uh, regarding the city of Syracuse and either uh, answer them today or, or commit to you to get back to be able to do that. I thought that when I was, uh, preparing for today that I first tell you a little bit about um, how I ended up where I am and why I'm doing what uh, I'm doing at this stage in my life. I thought then uh, very naturally it would lead into me sharing with you a little bit more about Mayor Walsh's vision for the city of Syracuse and the plans and initiatives that we have underway to accomplish that vision and lastly, um, I wanted to take you through a very recently announced, just last week, introduction of the city's new performance management plan, uh, which is uh, a metrics dashboard that shows uh, members of the whole community, including all of you if you choose, the ability to track the progress that the city is making against the major objectives that the mayor has set for us to achieve our vision. And I think we'll cover a lot of ground on that path uh, and then uh, hopefully set the stage for some good discussion and questions uh, from all of you on anything that I that I didn't cover that you wished that I might have. Hold on. I saw that story mm -hmm. on the internet and I think in the hardcore paper. Yes. <laughs> they did well, cover it. They, they're doing, and they're doing the Syracuse newspaper, the post standard at Syracuse.com has got their S together very well in covering the city and the mayor and the administration and even the county and the whole, the whole story. How did Ben get triggered up? How did he get juiced up? What was his input? He was sitting one night having a beer and he said, ah, this is my game. Or you, somebody feels it. You mean, you mean the question of how did he get jazzed to become, right. to, be, to, to become mayor? Well, I understand or, how or, he became, yeah, yeah I understand. Uh, <laughs> to, do, to, do, to do the performance management program? Right, right. So it's a, it's a good question and it's connected in many ways to what got me interested in actually changing my life and, and moving to the city and going to work for the mayor. Um, the answer is, that he has always believed fundamentally and heard a lot from people when he was running as a candidate that government needed to answer to the people, uh, that government needs to be accountable to the people who pay for government. So accountability, Lou, is fundamental to who he is and what he wants. And you can't be, you can't be accountable if you're not giving people a chance to actually get some transparency into how what you you get doing. that message into, uh Pennsylvania Avenue, and, <laughs> and how do you get that message into that dude who thinks he's governor of New York State? Well, I think what we do is do our job really well and show people that it works and show people how the city uh, makes progress, we hope, quickly. Um, and, and people will start to notice that, that transparency and accountability uh, are, are really what, what government should be thinking about first and foremost. The, the mayor 
you know, related to that, believes that uh, that government is a service to the people and has charged all of us uh, early in his administration to build a service culture at City Hall. Uh, and this message is very well received, obviously, when I speak before a city audience because residents are, are expecting and wanting to, to find a government that looks to find a way to say yes to them as opposed to, to no all the time. Or instead of saying, that's not the way we do things, saying, how can we help you? Um, when, when Ben was running for office and I was volunteering on his campaign back um, well, a year ago or so now, really, and I, uh, I got to know him uh, just because I knew his dad, like many people in the room might say, you know, know Jim, liked Jim, admired him, knew him for a long time, likely knew, uh, knew Ben, but didn't know him well, but thought he would be a good candidate for mayor, jumped in and said, I'll just offer to help. And my expertise is in uh, public relations, communications, as, as Lou said, I spent 30 years working with Eric Moore and Associates and um, ran the firm's public relations division. Uh, along that way, I worked with a lot of different leaders on their communication skills and how they can um, best but, deliver uh, the messages that they want to get across. And I offered to help help him with that. Um, and in the process, um, I got to know him better and better and better as the year went along. And about a year ago this time, now September obviously, election day was getting pretty close. And a year ago now, I was starting to spend a lot of time volunteering uh, on the campaign. In particular, we were getting around that time of year where you're gonna see this in the news with this year's cycle of elections, uh, where we were getting ready for debate season. And one of the things that I dove in hard to help the mayor on was to help him be better prepared for those debates, which are important times where people really size up an individual, get to look them in the eyes, get to see how they handle uh, questions and moments that they're not prepared for. I mean, had a good time doing that, and I got to know him better. But it took a lot of time. And a high school senior daughter was over at FM uh, finishing her, her uh, education uh, at, at the district here. Um, and we were at the dinner table in probably <coughs> mid-October or so, and she started asking me more and more questions about this city campaign that I was involved in and the mayor and why I was doing it. And it, it caught my attention because um, she had never really been interested in civics. Uh, she's a math kid. Um, and she got very interested in who Ben Walsh was and started to read more news. Um, and one day, uh, she was on her way back into town, she's a hockey player, back into town from an out-of-town hockey tournament, and I was stopping in the campaign office for the night to help the mayor prepare uh, for his debate uh, the next day. Actually, it was actually that night, it was the Channel 9 debate, um, uh, which was, uh, yeah, we must have been almost in November at this point. Um, and my wife said casually to my very shy daughter, do you want to go in the campaign office and meet the mayor? And I thought for sure she'd say no. And she said yes, and hopped out of the car right away. Mm -hmm. And this 17-year-old marched right into the campaign office and was wowed by what she saw. Because anyone who's been around campaigns in those days leading into an election knows these, these campaign offices just hum with excitement. And there was a buzz in that room. And she saw a place that, um, excited her, uh, filled with people of, and it was a proud moment for me to even be associated with what was going on in there. This room of people, dozens and dozens of people of all ages, uh, races, uh, financial status, rolling up their sleeves together, trying to support this young guy who, who had pretty successfully brought together a very broad coalition of people who said, I think this guy's heart is in the right place. And that afternoon, uh, the mayor was in a meeting and my daughter Nancy didn't get to meet him and she had to leave. And I thought she'd think nothing of it. And I got a phone call from my wife at the Channel 9 Studios a little bit later when we were over there and she said, Nancy's really mad at me. You know, <laughs> she, she said I could meet the mayor and, I, and she didn't get a chance to. By then you'd already addressed him as mayor. Uh, not yet, no sir, he was still mad in those days. Um, and so um, she said, is there any way that she could come down to Channel 9 and, and see him at the debate? And again, I thought, 
this is really, this is not my daughter. This is not the kid that I know. And she came down and she waited and she had the chance to meet the mayor in person after the debate, Ben in person after the debate. And uh, she was really caught by the bug of her community and civic leadership. She volunteered two days later to spend the day with me on the campaign trail with him on election day, two or three days later, whatever it was. And we were his body people for the day, helping him go from place to place to place in election site. And of course, then you know, uh, that night it was an exciting night and Nancy came to the hotel and uh, saw this great celebration of Mayor Walsh's, uh, now uh, Mayor-elect Walsh's victory. Uh, and something clicked with me at that point. And I thought, never having once entertained the notion of, of doing this permanently, or at least changing my life in the way it was, something clicked and I thought, there's really something here. Uh, this guy is unique, he's different. Um, he inspires hope. And uh, I let that thought go and moved on with the night, and moved on with the back to the regular work. And over the next couple of weeks, there were more meetings and I helped him do some transition things, brought him to the Syracuse newspaper's editorial board and helped him prepare and answer questions for that. It was a great discussion. Uh, even the editorial board, um, cynical and grizzled journalists were clearly looking at this guy and, and, and finding him to be someone that, that we, could, we could maybe hope to see some, some better times for Syracuse. And, uh, I came home that day and my wife said, are you going to go to work for him? And I said, no, that'll never happen. And I'm not going to do that. And it clicked a little more. And over the next days we talked about it and decided to make this, this big change and, and take a job with the new administration and make a commitment to Syracuse and see if we could help uh, make the city better. Did he create the position there was a job so I'm director of city initiatives which was a job was previously called director of mayoral initiatives so people who have uh, kept a uh, close eye on city government over the years that was a job that a guy named Tim Carroll held for a number of years if you recognize that name so uh, director of mayoral initiatives um, and Mayor Walsh didn't like the idea of needing a mayoral initiatives person, but he thought somebody who was responsible for city initiatives, somebody who was responsible for making things go forward and creating progress in the city was a smarter way to have somebody spend their time. Of course, one of my big duties is, is communications, community relations, marketing for the city, and I have a team that works with me to help me do that. But I also get a real um, uh, honor to work on a really wide range of initiatives, of projects, of special projects that are either maybe particularly hard or challenging, that could be really difficult for the city, bad news sometimes, but also the chance to work on things that are really good news and good opportunities for the city and because it's good for the whole city, uh, a chance, as, as Lou said before, uh, something that's good for this whole region. Um, and as somebody who, uh, lived out in the village of Fayetteville for uh, 30 years. Um, I always drove into the city every day and I think like probably everybody here understand and appreciate the importance of the city even to our life and our success and, uh, and the quality of life we experience here in, in Manlius. We may have different government and we may have different services, uh, but the two are intimately connected. And so it was natural for me to think about uh, an address change and, and going to work for the mayor. So the job existed, we changed the title a little bit. Uh, before our new senior staff management team came in to work with the mayor, we reoriented the org structure in the mayor's office completely in a way we thought was much more logical to the, uh, to the requirements of the mayor's office. And some of you, if you've been, again, if you've kept a close eye on the mayor's administration as he took over, he brought in, we think, a really strong leadership team with him. And I'll just tell you quickly who this core team is, and there are many other great people, department heads who were already there in city government, or who came to the mayor from the private sector uh, to, to join his administration, but the mayor's core leadership team starts with his deputy mayor, Sharon Owens, who uh, joined the city from uh, one of the largest uh, community service, community organizations in the city, the Southwest Community Center, 
over on South Avenue, a really important organization to urban neighborhoods. Sharon ran the Southwest Community Center very successfully. In addition to her role as deputy mayor, where she uh, joins the mayor in a number of uh, public functions, um, she has responsibilities acting as a chief of staff for the mayor's uh, team and importantly overseas when we organized the org chart we said there needs to be one person who's responsible for the departments that deal with quality of life and so Sharon has reporting to her the chief of police the chief of fire the parks and recreation department and the neighborhood and business development group which deals with issues around housing neighborhoods and economic development four city departments that are really Sharon, if you look at that list of departments, police and fire are the two uh, most expensive city departments and play a really direct role in quality of life and safety in people's, uh, people's worlds. So she has some really important departments that, that report to her, not to mention uh, the importance of our parks department in, in how people get a chance to enjoy the city. And we have incredible parks uh, in the city of Syracuse. Me having just moved there, come to know two parks really well that I didn't know that are in my new neighborhood. <laughs> Schiller Park, an amazing park on the north side, uh, and Lincoln Park, uh, just over on the edge of uh, the north side and the Eastwood area. I haven't gotten over to Suncrest yet on a run, but I will. Uh, it's loaded with beautiful parks and Sharon's So when you're in Schiller Park, you can skate down to Riley's. Uh, yes, you can go downhill pretty easily there. Be careful. Uh, Schiller's a beautiful park. Uh, okay. Um, the mayor brought in uh, from um, Washington, D.C., a Syracuse native who wanted to come back home, a woman named Christy Elliott, who was a management consultant with the global consulting firm Deloitte & Touche. Uh, she specialized in government consulting, so uh, she took over administration. She has finance, uh, taxation, IT, Chief Data Officer in Innovation. Uh, four departments uh, that deal a lot with how the city runs administratively. Um, and Christie's specialty as a consultant was always in the use of data to make good decisions. And she's brought that discipline to our team at City Hall. And using data, you're gonna see me show you before I finish today on the performance management plan, is central to how we report to people on accountability. We show it to people in very measurable, numbers-based ways so it can be tracked and really measured what we're up to. So Christy is, uh, what the mayor was able to accomplish was to bring in a world-class consultant uh, for government organizations around the world and here in the United States to work full-time for him and for us. She's terrific. Um, our director of operations is Corey Driscoll Dunham, who has worked at multiple levels of government at both, worked in city government as the head of constituent services under prior mayors. Um, also went on and worked in the state legislature, uh, worked in Congress with Dan Maffei, um, and now uh, has joined us with direct experience from her time as the head of code enforcement in the city, a really important uh, part of ensuring quality of life in the city. Corey has responsibility for DPW, water department, personnel, and the airport. Now the airport is a separate authority, but she has one or two staff people. City is a liaison. We own the land on which the airport sits. The airport operates independently as an authority. DPW, water, engineering, personnel. The infrastructure that makes the city work. Logically grouped together, smart grouping of, 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 of business units that can work better together as a portfolio under this structure. So quality of life, administration, uh, operations. Um, my category uh, is uh, city initiatives, which includes communications, constituent service, intergovernmental relations. So I, my team works a lot with all of the other governmental entities, federal, state, local, 
really important that we have strong, good working relationships with our municipal partners. And the mayor has made a, a high priority on ensuring that we work at, at, at all levels, at the staff level very closely, and at his level direct face to face with, again, federal, state, county, and municipalities. Um, and then um, our uh, fifth key team member joined us from the law firm of Bond, Schenick, and King, uh, our corporation counsel, Kristen Smith, whose plate is full at all times with a good, strong team in our law department um, in providing services. You can imagine, obviously, and anybody who's been connected to government understands and knows the amount of uh, legal challenges that come out of government uh, on virtually a daily basis, and Kristen leads the team that's involved with that. So a logical uh, organization structure, which has helped us to proceed, uh, we think, very strategically uh, on um, helping to uh, make the city stronger and by virtue of that, make the whole region stronger. How do you measure the what we're doing? of the data execution. Okay, uh, let me answer that question you don't do that. on the path. And, and because I think you're gonna see very clearly how we measure when I talk to you next about um, our, our vision and our strategy. So we could in government go to, work, go to work every day and work really, really hard, and we do, just responding to requests because you know, we have uh, 145,000 people living in the city uh, and they all uh, have needs and interests and strong opinions on the way government should run. And we work very hard to be responsive. But we also need, and the mayor recognized the importance of having a proactive strategy, a plan for how we were gonna accomplish these big, big challenges that the city faces. So back in February, on a Sunday, uh, early in our term, the mayor had that five-person management team and him gather for a full-day strategic planning session. We used a model of business planning uh, called the OKR system. And if you're interested, uh, when you go online later, uh, you can Google the OKR management system. It stands for Objectives, Key Results. OKR, Objectives and Key Results been used by a number of the uh, successful technology companies in America today. OKR was the foundational program that Google used to build and grow its business. One of the city's great most successful tech companies, um, TCG Player, which some of you may have heard about, a fast growing company located uh, in downtown Syracuse in the technology field, used and uses OKR to manage and measure their business. OKR begins with some really important steps that we worked on that Sunday morning at Highland Forest. The county donated Highland yeah. Forest to the, for the day so that we could get off site, think clearly, get up on the top of a big hill on a winter day, lock ourselves in a room for the day, and just think, what, what, you know, what, do, we, what do we do to address <laughs> these massive challenges that the city faces? And the first thing you have to do in the OKR program is um, have a vision. And, so we talked about what we want to see the city have for a vision. Syracuse will be a growing city, which is a fundamentally a big tax. City has, Syracuse has not been a growing city in decades. I think you all know, we have a city today who uh, is really built for a population of somewhere in excess of 220, 240,000 people. We peaked at our population in Syracuse in the 1950s. Uh, and we've declined ever since then. And we've had smattering of, of growth in the city at times, but we haven't had sustained growth. And the mayor and our team said, we're gonna make Syracuse a growing city. A city that embraces diversity and recognizes not unlike the coalition that the mayor brought forward that got a wide group of people excited about the potential for the future, that embraces diversity and creates opportunity for all. So inclusion is a critical part of our success formula. We have to make sure that as we create growth, we create opportunities for people at all income levels. Because I'm sure this room knows of the challenges that the city faces with concentrated poverty, 
concentrated poverty for those who have heard of the, the topic generally, sometimes people reach the conclusion that we have the highest poverty of a city in the country, and that isn't the definition. We have the highest concentrated poverty, which means we have some neighborhoods that have the highest poverty of any city in the country, or the top 10 of cities. So we have pockets of poverty that are deep. Um, the leading neighborhood that has poverty challenges, I think people might know, is the near west side. Um, and, and we can't be successful as a city with those kinds of poverty statistics. We have to address that. And so growth has to address uh, opportunity for all. And I think I'll, I'll be able, to, I'll start today to be able to show you some things that are, that are on that path. That's a long road. We won't eliminate all of that if the mayor has one term or two terms even. We won't get all the way there, but we, we will get on a good path. So a vision of growth, simple goal. We gotta think about how do we create growth and it guides us everything in what we do. The um, next stage of a successful business strategy using the OKR approach is setting clear objectives. Um, and so, I don't know if you can read that or not, I can't see the screen, but I can tell you what the four are because they're emblazoned in our heads and we, we do our business uh, planning and our planning for the city every day off of these four objectives. And the first is to achieve fiscal sustainability. We can't accomplish anything we want to accomplish in the city uh, if we continue to be a city on a weak financial foundation. Now, Fortunately, the city has cash reserves that have allowed it to move through a number of years in which it has lost money. It operate, from an operating basis, I think you all know, the city is operating at a deficit. And as the mayor has said on multiple occasions, that is an unsustainable model. We can't allow that to continue. We need to begin changing it right away. We need to reduce deficits and we need to eliminate them as quickly as possible. Because if the city continued on the same path it was on, the reserves had maybe two and a half to three years left before you were looking at fiscal control board for the city um, and bankruptcy. Uh, and that's a path that is not a good one for our region. And so achieving fiscal sustainability is our first objective. The second objective in the right order is to um, improve our neighborhoods, uh, neighborhood uh, economic growth, and neighborhood stability. So we need, that's the growth objective, that when we do that, we help make the places where people live better. Third objective, deliver city services more efficiently, effectively, um, and we added to this one, since I created this chart, equitably, to make sure that we deliver city services uh, to people across the entire city effectively, efficiently, and with equity. So all people in the city get the best services that they can get. This is the simple thing of, you should get good service from your city, from your municipality. And we haven't accomplished this yet. You can imagine, this is a long path and um, uh, it'll take us a while to get there, but we're making progress already and it's measurable in the management, in the performance management program, I'm going to talk to you about in a little bit. And the third is to improve constituent uh, engagement, or the fourth rather, is to provide high quality constituent engagement and response. To give people a chance to be heard by the city, uh, to reach out to people in the city, to listen to them, and to respond to the concerns and interests that they have. To be a city that listens and to be a city that acts. Those four key objectives have really guided uh, everything that we've done, starting with, and they were very strategically important to us in the, one of the first major initiatives that we had to take on, which was our first budget. One of the challenges of taking over as a new administration is in a very short period of time, you have some really big challenges, in, to, and in the city, some really big challenges to tackle operationally. So the mayor took office uh, January 1. Uh, by January, by the end of January, by January 31st, um, did I get that right, by the end of January? Yeah, it was the end of January. 
the mayor needed to deliver his first state of the city address within a month. Um, big challenge, uh, set a vision, talk about where you wanna go. Right on the heels of that, the mayor by the middle of, uh, by the first week in March, needed to deliver his first budget. Uh, and the budget grew out of those objectives of fiscal sustainability, uh, neighborhood stability and economic growth, delivering city services more efficiently, and constituent engagement and response. Uh, the city's operating budget is around $245 million. Is that what the number says? Mm -hmm. Yeah, around $245 million. We, uh, through cost containment efforts at the department level, were able to keep the city spending flat to what the previous year was, no increase in spending. The way we did that is when our department heads came in with their first round budgets, uh, we asked them to then go back and take 10% off. And we chose that route instead of seeking a property tax increase, which some people question. Uh, a city that's losing money, shouldn't it be increasing taxes to try to help close the deficit? If we're serious about closing the deficit, then raising taxes at some point is, is an inevitability for us to be able to do that. But our point of view was first, because of the relatively small, low, rate of taxable properties in the city. It's something around 60% of properties are actually taxable in the city because of a large amount of non-profit or non-taxable properties. Um, even you know, a one or 2% increase in the property tax rate, by the time it goes through the county and the county takes its share, uh, which is not a fault, that's the way the system works, uh, $100,000, $200,000. Is the 245 inclusive of the uh, school budget? No. No, it's, at the school district is separate from the 245. The school district budget, I don't know, you know, the city school district budget is almost twice that. It's $449 million. What is, where does that money come from? The tax credits, state education department. So you drop off, you, you, you immediately, you're sitting there and you say, we have to give the school district Four hundred and ninety million. Obviously, dollars. state, state education department provides. I don't remember the aid numbers that the state education department mm -hmm. provides, but yes, government and taxpayers. Uh, you know, the, the the far bigger cost in operating the city is are the schools, and this city, the schools, uh, operate just as they do here in in Manly's separate board, separate governance. And while the mayor has uh, the, the bully pulpit to try to advocate for our schools and push for excellence in our schools, he has no oversight over the way the schools are operated and managed. There was a candidate who ran for mayor, you may, may have known her, uh, Laura Levine, who ran on a platform of saying that her primary platform was that the mayors should take over management of the schools, that the city should operate the schools. Uh, that wasn't a path uh, that uh, Mayor Walsh thought was wise and recognizes that right now we got a whole lot of challenges that we need to get straight run in the city first. And I think we're going to be on a good path to do that. The reason I went down that road quickly about this, this um, no property tax uh, increase was also to point out that it was the mayor's strong opinion that until we could get our house in order, until we knew that we were using the dollars we were getting as effectively as we can, then it wasn't time yet to ask the taxpayers to pay more. And our observation so far is we can make a lot of progress and our, and our budget plan has many specific initiatives that allow us to better spend the dollars that we get, starting with saying to our department heads, not just, not just um, go even, take 10% off, we, we need to find a way to spend less. And we've looked at many of those kinds of principles in everything that we do every day in city government. Uh, do I think that there's a point that someday the city will need to take a look at a tax increase? I would imagine it will. But it will be when we have more confidence, when we have confidence that we're spending the dollars that we have as wisely as we should. The mayor took another step uh, in, in, that has been important and will help the city in its recovery um, that previous administrations had chosen not to do, um, and that was to apply for state assistance through the Financial Restructuring Board. This is not a fiscal control board, which you may have seen other cities in the state have ended up with a fiscal control board. The fiscal control board actually was helpful to the city of Buffalo at one point in its recovery. It, it had a, a fiscal control board. 
We don't believe that's the way to go, but the state offers a program called the Financial Restructuring Board. And through the Financial Restructuring Board, if you can demonstrate that you are a city of, uh, that has the financial challenges that require it, uh, the state will provide you at its expense uh, outside consulting expertise to look at efficiency in your government at all levels, to make recommendations on how you can improve government efficiency, and then we'll provide up to $5 million for the implementation of the recommendations that you choose to take advantage of uh, that are made by that consultant. And so we were accepted by the Financial Restructuring Board uh, in uh, late spring. Uh, the state has assigned uh, a, uh, a team now that is beginning work to work with the city, bringing us very high level outside expertise to look at all of our operations, and then we'll start to dive deep and find ways to make sure we're spending the money we get as effectively as we can. Does the mayor and the governor get along? The mayor and the governor get along very well. It was just at a public meeting, a neighborhood watch group um, on the north side of the city uh, on Tuesday night and Monday night. And the first question that was asked was that question by a citizen about whether or not we've reached a point where we have a better relationship with the state. And I referenced earlier, previous administrations chose not to go for the FRB because it's a state program. And the relationship with the state was very tense. Um, and because of that, uh, the city was limited in the help that it could get. Um, and it was limited in the help it accepted. And Mayor Walsh, as a candidate, was determined to, to, and talked about his desire to change that. And I don't know how many of you have ever had the chance to meet Mayor Walsh. I, I'm sure that I saw many of you nod your heads that you, you know his dad. Uh, there are many similarities between the two. Uh, but Mayor Walsh is um, a collaborator, first and foremost. Very smart man, but he, he, he knows how to work with it. Yes. Like his grandfather, he has a lot of, I, I only knew his grandfather for a very short period of time. But my point in saying that is, is he's lived the challenge of, uh, and, and the walk of, of building strong relationships. And he and the government, uh, he and the governor talked right after he was elected uh, by phone. Uh, they continued to stay in touch uh, through staff and by phone over the first months of the administration. Uh, I'm going to talk about a major initiative in addition to the Financial Restructuring Board that is a partnership with the state uh, momentarily that is a, sing a signal of the close working relationship, the acquisition of the streetlight network in the city, which I'll tell you about why that's important before we're done. Um, and just recently, uh, the mayor was uh, with uh, the governor at the opening of the Expo Center, and the governor invited him back to be with him and to join him at the dais for the announcement of the state fair record on attendance. So there's, there are a number of things that are good signs of that. Un unrelated topic, since the mayor is not affiliated as a Republican or, or a Democrat, <laughs> I just wondered how he got along with the different parties. Yeah. Um, well, um, he, did, he did very well on that front, which is, and has continued to do very well on that front as a sitting mayor because, um, his interests uh, aren't, his actions are in no way um, uh, influenced by one particular party's actions or another. And so from the hiring decisions that he made when he became mayor, he was able to select people to come to join him who had nobody telling him from a particular party persuasion that that was the person they wanted to get the job. So I'll give you a good example of, 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 of how I think it's improved services. So when the, the, the mayor decided he was, uh, there was a retirement at the head of DPW, there really can be, um, I certainly think obviously police and fire are important. DPW is the third uh, biggest spending department in government. <coughs> it has so much to do with how our lives are experienced. You all have that in your, in your community here in Manly. It's a really important job. You know, traditionally that's been somebody who's been around government for a while or that job goes to somebody who's uh, been part of perhaps the, the party machine. The mayor selected a guy who never worked a day in government before in his entire life whose resume he heard about because he, a city resident who he heard 
was a, a very strong manager with experience working with labor unions, and he drafted a guy out of um, uh, an auto parts manufacturing uh, factory in Auburn where he was working to come home. Um, and he had worked at Magnet in East Syracuse and was at the TR, I think it's the TRW plant in, in Auburn. A top-notch manager uh, whose responsibility was uh, figuring out how to get more productivity out of people every day. Like, what does a modern factory, factory expect? So he's brought a management philosophy to it. My point is the mayor's been able to select good people and he's been able to make decisions that aren't related to party constraints. So he's done very well with representatives of both parties. That Dale Street meeting that I was just at, uh, at the North Side Neighborhood Watch meeting, uh, when the person asked the question about how you doing getting along, um, the, uh, one of the city councilors who feuded constantly with the previous administration who was sitting in the back of the room said, I'm just gonna raise my hand and say what Greg and Corey uh, can't tell you, which is it's night and day here in the city from what we experienced previously to what we experienced today. I can't tell you how refreshing it is to be able to go up to the mayor's office and come in and sit down and talk to the mayor or to schedule a meeting with a member of his senior staff and have them accept it and sit down and disagree or agree and move forward on a plan of what we need to do. So this budget that's up here, one of the first examples of the mayor's ability to bring people together on a bipartisan basis was this budget. You may remember when this story appeared, it was approved by the Common Council unanimously with no changes made from the council. And no one can remember that happening in the history of the city, certainly not in recent history. And I thought that was a great sign of collaboration and working closely with counselors. But I said to Helen Hudson, the president of the council at the time, that I thought that the more significant outcome of that was that we weren't, when, when the council told us when we first presented that budget and the indications were that it was, there were gonna be questions in the hearings, but we moved through that two and a half intense period, two and a half week intense period of hearings and it was done and the council was inclined to agree and the council approved it. The significance was we didn't lose two months fighting over a budget and differences that we could have resolved if we'd worked together. We spent those two months getting going. We were acting, we were, so I'm gonna tell you about things that were in this budget plan that we didn't just say we were going to do, we're already doing them because we didn't fight over a budget. Because we invited those counselors in while we were building the budget, we showed them the objectives, we showed them some of the ideas we had, we asked them for input, and, we, and, then, and then we put forth the budget. So you can tell I'm optimistic about it, I know you can, I, I, I hope you can, because I feel like we're seeing results already of some of the fundamental some of the fundamental uh, attributes that Mayor Walsh brings uh, to the role uh, of leading the city. Greg, let me add a little insight to what you said. I see what you're saying is that the mayor is not, decisions are not made for political, personal political uh, reasoning. That's not what his goal is, is political, every decision has to be politically looked at. That is not even thought about. That is not, it's not part of the deal, kids. Throw that away. Well, I think that's true. I think that uh, one of the things that I, I, I marvel at about, about Mayor Walsh is that I see virtually no ego on the job every day. Uh, and I know we must have one, right? I mean, there's just no way you could take on this giant responsibility as a pretty young guy, he's not even 40 yet, um, without having some pretty, pretty strong self-confidence. Um, and uh, he, I think he, he drives himself to work every day. Uh, he parks his car in front, and I think he deposits his ego in his glove box and says, we'll, come, we'll see that at the end of the day. And he just goes to work trying to do the right thing. I mean, clearly, right, he's in a political business. So he has to, and we have to think about 
political implications and how we work with representatives of both sides, how the politics of an election season factors into trying to get things done. We have congressional elections that are being closely watched and are close. We have a very controversial governor's uh, race, you know, primary coming up. Um, and all of those political issues, they're there. We have, to, we have to look at them, but we don't have to make our decisions controlled by them. We just have to be mindful of that. As part of this conversation, it is, I think, six weeks or seven weeks or mm -hmm. something like that to the day of decision, mm -hmm. November 6th. He has not said word one which way or another that he leads. Whether it's Mrs. Dick, Mrs. Nixon yep. or Andy or whoever yep. or the yep. Velasco or Capco, he has not not one political word has come out of his mouth. I think that um, you know it's it, it, at the risk of now sounding political um, or using a, a, a trite phrase. It really is one of those cases, and it is hard as. It's not his place to tell people how to vote. It's his. It, it's not, and it's not his place to to try to make selections. That's for all of us to make our decisions. Uh, but we look at the actions that we that we take, and, and 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 try to let people see by the actions that we take uh, what we believe in, what he believes in, who he believes uh, is providing uh, some genuine support and help to the city. Um, and how and, and that that guy some of the decisions uh, about about what he says and what he does but I I would not expect Lou I can't speak for him on this front fully but I would not expect to see him change to a place where he's uh, talking about individual races uh, yeah. Actually, if, he's, if he's smart he wouldn't because they could go back and haunt him and can, so yeah. you know He's in a very good position. Well, and, and you can look at when, he can play games with anybody. When he ran for office, um, I, you know, you, I, having been, I was watching it as somebody supporting him uh, a year ago. Um, most elected leaders chose not to make it this, not not to, to finger who they wanted, um, and that's a, a, a respect. You can respect that position and say, okay. One of the ironies of government at the local level, which which the city of Syracuse as is the county of Onondaga, uh, there, there, are, there are these major services that have to be provided, uh, hopefully efficiently and with intelligence and, yep. and, and along the lines of what your uh, what, what now new mayor is, uh, is embarked upon. But ideology is much less important True. At, the, at the local level. True. Uh, True. So to my mind, that explains, for example, how the County of Onondaga has had a succession of Republican County executives from John Mulroy, uh, Nick Pirro, yep. now Joni Mahoney. They, they walk a line that uh, truly is moderate, and I'm yep. speaking as a lifelong Democrat, observing the succession of sure. Republicans. And they get elected, and often by substantial majorities, in, um, and I think it's a consequence of uh, the fact that they don't have to necessarily stake out ideologically problematic positions that anger people. And uh, I mean, you can't exclude really politics completely yeah. from, uh, but, but it's just a lot easier at the local level to... Uh, I agree, the focus at the local level is very much on services, on neighborhood issues, on what are you doing to make my life better, and that's not very ideologically driven. Yes. I have a question, but maybe you'd like to finish your presentation. Yeah, I'll go through it. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. I will. I'll, I'll move through and, and get to questions. You're an agent. No, I'll okay. get to questions. I'll be the first one. I hope that means you like what I'm going through and then find it interesting. So I'll try to get to questions as, as quickly as I can. Um, you know, you mentioned the county level, and, and we have a very strong working relationship day in and day out with the county executive. That is also critically important. We talk about the state level relationship, but that county relationship is really important to find opportunities to do things more efficiently. The county has a better uh, financial health right now and is willing to provide its assistance to the city. We have a sitting county executive who understands the importance of the city to the whole region. And so uh, she is very helpful to us every day. 
and, and we in, in turn uh, work to be very helpful back to uh, the county so that that relationship stays strong. There are a number of major initiatives that are underway, and I'm not going to have time to cover them all with you, but I want to point to a couple that are up here, things that, that we're proud of that we've tried to accomplish um, and are already underway on. I'm going to start, I'm going to not do this in order, I'm going to go randomly through this because I can touch on some pretty quickly and then they'll lead into a different order. Um, so the last from the bottom, or one up from the bottom, the chief of police search. The mayor chose uh, the chief of police, Frank Fowler, uh, announced his retirement uh, under the minor administration. He agreed to stay on for one more year at the request of the mayor to allow us to have a more thoughtful search for a police chief. Uh, this is a really important hire. Uh, to the people who live in the city and every day to a mayor to have a, the right police chief. Um, and so the mayor wanted to make sure that he got uh, community engagement in the process of selecting a police chief. So over the past, for the first, eh, let's see, we're still there. for about three months, we conducted a very extensive community input and stakeholder engagement process. We held 10 public meetings throughout the city, sponsored with, by local organizations, in which we sat down and had an open dialogue about what they wanted to see in a police chief and what they thought about policing in their neighborhoods. Uh, we didn't just do neighborhood meetings. The mayor and the deputy mayor, who is running the search every day, uh, running the search for, for the mayor, held 36 individual stakeholder meetings. So we made sure that he sat down with Bill Fitzpatrick and said, what do you think we need in a police chief, Mr. DA? You deal with our police chief more than anybody else. And what do we need? And he went and talked to the U.S. Attorney, and he went and talked to John D. Francisco, uh, and he went and talked to Dave, go down the list, Gene Conway, and said, what do we need? And we produced a very comprehensive report, which if you went to our website, if you're interested, you could read a 75-page transparent report on what we were told people want to see in a police chief. And we are now in the final days, today is the 12th, so the uh, resume collection process ends in three days, uh, and we will, by later this month, the consultant that we're using to help us look at candidates locally and nationally, because we are interested in local candidates, but the mayor has made it clear he wants to make sure we select from the best field possible. And the way to do that is to open it up nationally, even while you look at local candidates. Um, and we will, um, in the next uh, six to eight weeks, uh, be narrowing our search and hopefully selecting a new police chief so we have a new police chief in place at the start of the new year. Uh, the community engagement here is something that people haven't seen before, the stakeholder engagement, of asking for input, we think will make it make the decision we make better. Um, you know, the third one from the top investor summit, we have a lot of property in the city that we don't need and don't use well. Uh, and so uh, our neighborhood and business development department as a way to create better neighborhoods and to create economic growth conducted in, we must have done it in June, time flies so fast, it must have been June, uh, an investor summit in which we invited uh, uh, financial management, uh, in, uh, real estate investment firms, property developers from all over New York State to come in and learn about uh, the process and the properties that are available in the city for investors to buy and purchase. And we are in the process now of executing a number of RFPs for request for proposal from developers for various properties that we want to turn into taxable revenue producing properties. Nobody done an investor summit in the city before. Uh, our NB, it wasn't, this wasn't the mayor's idea, this was a good idea from the NBD, the Neighborhood Business Development Department that said, we ought to invite people in and show them what we've got and let's get the process going of, of monetizing these assets. Um, are those mayor, assets, excuse me, I, I hate to follow oh, up, no, that's okay. to interrupt, but, uh, but just to clarify, are those properties like city city properties mm -hmm. or are they private properties? No, city properties. Tax city properties we own. Uh, not, and not properties held by the land bank. The land bank is an entity established that the mayor supported when he was, the creation of it when he was working for the city. The land bank is able to 
take properties that are uh, in back taxes and we take control of those properties. In some instances, we either maintain the property so that blight, we have less blight in the city. We have too much housing in the city. I said earlier, right? Built for 220,000 people, 145,000 people today. We have too many houses. Uh, and so until we can get more people in the city, we've got to figure out what we do with all this excess housing stock. The land bank gives us an entity to, to care for those properties or in some instances to proceed over time with controlled demolition of properties and then it cares for a vacant lot while the land bank, go online sometime, Google Syracuse Land Bank and look at the number of properties that are available for purchase for hundreds or low thousands of dollars that, um, that people are increasingly getting some great, some great bargains. Um, sometimes they're in challenged neighborhoods, sometimes they're on the fringes and the land bank will be a critical part of us restoring non-productive housing and, and, and business properties that need to be brought back. How do you seek out the users of that property? Uh, how do you seek out the users? How do we make sure people take it? How do you, yeah. how do you target those potential users of that property? Um, well, our neighborhood and business development group is always in the, uh, working with, the land bank is a separate entity it markets its properties so that people are aware of it, and then the Neighborhood and Business Development Group is always working proactively with commercial people with commercial property interests or people who are trying to become a first-time home buyer or to buy property to direct them toward this as a way to achieve home ownership or land ownership. Sometimes it's a group, a community group comes forward and says, we'd like to create, you know, you've heard some examples of this, a garden in the city. We can direct them to a land bank property that they can then care for, and it's a whole lot better than just a, uh, a, a, grass, a grass yard. How do you get Amazon to come here? <laughs> That's a, well, I, you, know, you, I have, you may have heard, no, Syracuse made a really compelling case with some creative ideas about Amazon. Obviously, we didn't make the finalist list. Center State CEO may have talked about this. I thought their creativity was great because Syracuse has a lot of attributes when you look at the whole region. Our workforce looks really good when you combine. If you look at a comparable commute time to what you face if you want to locate Amazon's headquarters in San Francisco, so now you're talking about an average commute time of an hour, right? Now look at what's within an hour of us, and we have a pretty large workplace, uh, <laughs> workforce that's available, uh, and suddenly the, the, you know, the capabilities and living and properties of a court. <coughs> so we have a, it's a long path we can get I, I claim that there are other Amazons, sure. smaller yeah. Amazons yeah. out there. I don't know who they are, but I'm sure if I look at it hard. Well, let me show you. I'm going to show you. I'm going to move through quickly a couple others. Small things, but important things. We created the first city adopt-a-block program uh, that's been done in years, and so uh, that we know of. Uh, the mayor's office started it. We invited individuals, neighborhood groups, community organizations to adopt a section of the city. We adopted a section at the mayor's office. Your requirement is to commit to two years to care for it, to go out once a month at least and do a proactive trash pickup. And then the rest of the year, your volunteers are asked to do spot cleanups. When you see a mess, pick it up. Uh, we gotta make the city look cleaner and better. If anybody watched, you may have seen, there was a wonderful editorial in the paper. Uh, the, uh, I was out with the mayor, the mayor goes out every, uh, first Saturday of the month uh, with our team and does the adopt-a-block in our neighborhood. He was picking up trash one day and you can imagine what people see with this guy walking down and he's got a bright orange jacket on and a picker and gloves and they look over and they double take and they go, is that the mayor? And, and so they got a letter to the editor saying, can you tell me if in fact I was right that I saw the mayor doing a trash pickup? Uh, and they said, yes, you were, and they found a picture of him online that somebody had taken and put a picture in the paper of it. Adopt-a-block is a really important small thing, but a big thing uh, that sends a message to people that we got to care for the city that we live in. Um, so uh, I'm going to go to uh, the acquisition of streetlights from a time standpoint, talk about what this program is about and why it's important. So, so why would a city that uh, loses uh, that's been that loses uh, money every year that operates in a deficit why would we spend 
$38 million to buy our streetlights, which some people will say are an aging network of streetlights that have little or no worth, which isn't true, um, that um, uh, we could be spending our money better than that. Uh, well, there's a really compelling reason why we want to buy our streetlights. Thank you. Well, so we can, we can, do, we, we can run the streetlight system with the emergence of LED technology with better lighting We'll make the transition to LED, and we will save millions of dollars a year. And we were able to do this because the Public Service Commission, at the direction of Governor Cuomo, uh, required as part of the utility company's last rate case, they had to agree to sell the streetlight assets at their net book value, I think is the right term as opposed to a, a rate that the utilities had previously set that was unachievable for cities to buy their streetlight networks back. They set a price that was just too high, and you couldn't make the case for it. But in order for them to get the rate agreement they wanted, they had to agree to sell us all the cities those assets at the book value. That suddenly put into play this incredible technology opportunity for cities. First, that we make the LED transition to far more efficient, better quality lighting, and we generate the savings, we get the savings from that. And so, when we buy the street lights, the money first, we're not using our money, we're using New York Power Authority money, and we're paying the New York Power Authority back with the savings we get from the LED transition, so it doesn't cost us anything, and we save so much money every year they will have an extra million dollars to spend on other city services to invest in the technology that we can now implement off the streetlight network. Okay. What can we do with the streetlights? Streetlight poles are several hundred to 500 feet apart. Um, they become, and they're literally all over the city, they become the backbone of the technology infrastructure of a smart city of the future. We can put and will put sensors that are connected wirelessly on every streetlight pole that we own in the city. And we can use it to do things like better control traffic lights, automate parking, change the lighting uh, based on time of day or conditions in the neighborhood. If the fire department is fighting a fire and they need more light, we can put the street lights up higher on that street. We can, we can use sensors that will be able to tell us how much snow is on a particular city street, or whether a side, or whether a, uh, uh, a uh, sewer is blocked and needs to be cleared. Sensors will be able to give us all of this ability. And so we're gonna be able to operate the city, remember that objective, deliver city services more efficiently and effectively? We'll be able to do that with the ability of the technology network, the infrastructure that the streetlights give us. But the even bigger last point about this, or connected to it that's really important is, the next generation of super fast wireless technology is 4G and 5G. 5G is the fastest wireless technology available. It is where the world is heading and cities have to be prepared to deliver the fastest wireless technology to be able to draw companies in. And um, when you own your streetlight network, you have the ability to now market, because guess how 5G is delivered? So right now, current wireless technology, right, we have those big towers spaced what, I don't know what they are, a couple miles apart, right? We see them everywhere, we eat them. 5G <laughs> is delivered by, by small towers every 500 feet. That's what a streetlight is. Streetlight Network gives us the existing infrastructure to host 5G wireless technology throughout the city and be able to get paid to do it by the wireless companies. So we can turn our streetlight network into a revenue generator. And, and we can get more quickly to a city that has the best wireless technology <laughs> in the country. Right now, there's only one other city in the United States that is as far along um, on the use of its streetlight network 
for technology and for a 5G wireless system in San Jose, California, uh, with New York Power Authority naming Syracuse the flagship smart city in New York, which is what NIPA has, has designated us in, in making its agreement with Syracuse to proceed on the streetlight acquisition. We will be the second fastest city in the country moving ahead with 4G, 5G wireless technology. It will make Syracuse a destination for business investment. All right. All right. I, I, my question is going to be about the not-for-profit agency mm -hmm. in the city. Mm -hmm. I, I've had two jobs, uh, both on the west side of town. Yeah. City of city. We know the west side. And yes, I know the west side. From years back, I'm mm -hmm. talking about. But, uh, like, I'll just name Huntington and Southwest Community Center do fabulous jobs. And, and I, I'm wondering what what do you, how do you, can you help some of these agencies? I, I was involved, one of the jobs was giving money to these agencies to, yeah. to do their job, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering, don't you agree that they- Oh, I do, I think they're essential to our ability to, to help ensure that any growth we create actually helps, helps people in the neighborhoods, particularly the, the impoverished neighborhoods. Um, so, we work really closely with all of those community organizations and we actually do some things differently than we've seen a, a pattern in city government for doing. So I'll give you an example of how we try to partner with those organizations to, to serve people better. Everybody saw uh, about two weeks ago there was that uh, terribly huge fire on the north side, on North mm -hmm. Salina Street. Mm -hmm. uh, four historic buildings uh, badly damaged by fire, the demolition work on at least the chunk of major parts of those buildings was already underway. Uh, when that fire was over, uh, the next morning, uh, the directive from the deputy mayor, who came from the Southwest Community Center, was, I'm glad that we're focused on the building, but I wanna know what's being done for the people who lived in that building, and I want a business, pl I want a plan delivered right away to me of how we're making sure that the people who lived, who were, who were displaced, who get a couple few days of very important Red Cross help. Critical, right? Red Cross swoops in really well. You get a few days to get yourself back on your feet. But after that, people of limited means don't have much. So we reached out to uh, the United Way. We reached out to Catholic Charities. Um, if you were at Huntington, you may remember that's where Mike Malara now is. And Mike is a great leader in our community. We convened a team immediately of those nonprofit groups to offer special services coordinated through Catholic Charities Northside CYO Center on Salina Street. Yeah, and so Northside CYO became the quarterback for helping those people. And you know what I learned that we didn't even know going into it, talking about better working with organizations? Catholic Charities actually has a contract with the city for relocation for people after fires. And so the mayor directed us to develop an emergency management plan, which didn't, doesn't exist, partnering with those organizations. I hope we're, I think your advice is really good. I'll go back and remind everybody and, and report to the team that we, this question was asked and that we have to make sure we're helping those organizations and teaming up with them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Utica has had a resurgence and it's been largely uh, fueled by the immigrant community. Yeah. Do you have a plan, or is that part of the planning for helping Syracuse grow? S Syracuse has a, a very strong um, immigrant and refugee community. Uh, the North Side in particular is a very multi-ethnic community. Uh, and uh, yes. generations of Thank your pardon? Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, and it's another place where our neighborhood and business development group is working very closely with the range of service organizations that exist to, to partner with all of the uh, refugee, immigration, immigrant, and even in cases, right, we, we are talking about undocumented workers uh, who are here in our community who are law-abiding and trying to get their lives on track. Um, this is a controversial issue, what you've raised, uh, and um, uh, it is, it is a, a delicate matter oftentimes to, to uh, manage because there are many who, who want to see 
uh, refugee and foreign uh, citizens uh, pushed out uh, of communities for reasons that I think are very wrong and don't recognize what cities like Utica have accomplished. Our mayor has promised to make Syracuse a welcoming community for refugees and for immigrants. Uh, he is able to pledge when it comes to this issue uh, that you may hear mentioned and read about on the sanctuary cities issue. Uh, uh, the mayor will simply point out on that matter that uh, it is not the business of our police department and it won't be to go after immigration issues where people are law abiding citizens. Our police department is there to address people who aren't abiding by the law. If you're abiding by the law, then you should you should be able to, to coexist uh, to try to make our city better. Um, and so we're trying to create a climate that is fair and equal for people so that we can. Look, look, the reality is Syracuse, I don't have the data today. I wish I did. I wish I remembered off the top of my head. Syracuse's population decline would be far greater uh, would it were it not for uh, the immigrant community that has arrived here. Utica has, has recognized that. And um, as you may have seen a story in the paper the other day, some of our school districts, strongest city school districts, strongest students uh, are those that come from uh, immigrant and refugee backgrounds. That's somewhat of a blessing. It's a great blessing. And, and so this, the, and, and, but it is also true that um, the, the uh, number of refugee relocations are down significantly. Uh, based on some of the current federal policies and so organizations that were uh, bringing in refugees are bringing in fewer right now just based on the available. So what you're saying is a lot of the bright students that are in our school system are coming from immigrants. That is, that is a fact. That's, and, 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 you know, Jaime Alice, just again, if you go online, you'll see a story from earlier this weekend about worried that we're gonna be missing superstars uh, who, who wanna make Syracuse home uh, because of uh, some of the um, <coughs> Well, the fact that there's an opportunity to learn and to do here in our community through the yeah. school system is an attribute. Yes. Which is a selling attribute yeah. for families. Yeah. Can we see the dashboard? I know, I'm going to go there next. I, I have it right here, I promise. <laughs> I'm glad you asked because I was going to say I'm going to go to the dashboard and that will inspire more questions, I think, and I'll stop uh, just telling you things and let you look. So this is our uh, performance dashboard. Where? Uh, okay, I know how to do this. Hang on. Let's see. Uh, I need to send this to the screen. Hang on. There's a way to do F1. this. F1. No, I'm going to do that. Do you think it is? F11. You think it's yes. function 11? Yes. You think? It, it just it just pops between. Hang on. Do it again. Did it really? Did you see that momentarily, Mike? It was your desktop, at least. Yeah, it's right there. Hang on, I have a different one. Let me try this. Hang on. I, okay, so if I do, I know how to do this. So watch. If I get out of this, <laughs> if I exit this presentation, all you will get. Want me to call GoDaddy and help you out? No, I'm gonna get it. <laughs> I got 10 minutes to make sure I show you the thing I came here to, to show you, which is this. And I need a minute of that 10. All right, well, it's just this machine is fairly slow, so it's shutting down from this presentation right now. I don't want to open it, I want to just close it. Who's this phone? Is that mine? Okay. Yes. We're getting to watch. There you go. Hey. Well done. I know we did that. So this is our City of Syracuse performance dashboard. And so this is available at a very simple URL. It's dashboards dot, and the, the standard URL for the City of Syracuse is syrgov, S-Y-R-G-O-V dot net. Uh, if you just type into your Google search, City of Syracuse website, you'll get to syrgov dot net, and on the home page, you'll see a headline to get you to this tool, which takes I'm gonna scroll down quickly to show you. It's structured around the objectives. So our first objective is achieve fiscal sustainability, right? The next objective, and it's a, it's a traffic light system. So if we're at green, that means that we are achieving our goal. If we're at red, we aren't there yet. And if we're at yellow, we're making progress. 
says on the way, I think, on our way. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our perspective on the colors right now because you're going to see a lot of red and yellow. So we're not there yet. Second, uh, increase economic investment and neighborhood stability. Improve the city's public engagement score, that's constituent services, and deliver city services effectively, efficiently, and equitably. Now, um, why are we in yellow and red? We're in yellow and red because we've set aggressive goals that we know we're not meeting because we're trying to get better. Uh, we know that a tool like this is in some ways counterintuitive for an elected leader to just say, hey, by the way, I'm failing here. Uh, I'm not succeeding on general budget variance today. Uh, but we feel like if we don't put it out there of what we're doing and hold ourselves accountable to getting it to yellow and to green, how are we going to get better? I mean, this is what we would have done, all of us, in, 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 in what I did in my job for 30 years in the private sector was sit around the management table and look at tools that told us where we weren't getting where we needed to get. And so the mayor points out all the time, this is not going to turn green almost ever. Because, as, see this one here? When this group, when the fiscal, when the administration team reports, this is going to be made harder because it's already green. So we don't, need to, we don't need to keep it green. We need to get it back to red and then figure out how we get better. So when we, and if we get this nailed, then we're going to pick a new metric. So let me just very quickly explain. So those were each of the objectives. The way the objectives key results management system works is for each objective, you set two measurable key results. And then you put specific metrics against it that are the numbers that you see here. So let me try to explain one of them for you so you see what we try to accomplish. So you can imagine in fiscal sustainability, there's literally a limited list number of things that we could measure. And so to start, we had to pick what do we want to start with. We tried to pick areas that we think, one, we can measure without having to spend a lot of money or resources to do it, right? I mean, if anybody has ever tried to do measurement, you know, one of the problems is it can take you more time to measure than it can to get the job done, right? So we can't get bogged in measuring. But we also have to pick something we can measure that when we measure it, it doesn't just affect one thing. It has to affect multiple things. It has to make improvements in multiple areas. So our first measurable objective in fiscal sustainability is to keep the general budget variance should be reduced from 11% today to 5%. Now, that's an accounting issue. And what it means is that pre for years, the city, during the year, the budget is way off, the actual performance is way off from the budget at any point in the year. There's no correlation between budget and actual. That's a terrible business practice because you can't really tell how your business is performing or make changes that you need to make. So it affects everything that you do. This is, we've done so bad on this that for probably 10 years, our accountant has stated this for the city as a, as a weakness in our man, in financial management of the city. And nobody's changed it. Because it's hard. Because it means we've got to fundamentally change so many things that we do. So that, and it starts with the principle that, and that um, uh, allotments in accounting so that our, our, our department heads, they have to think more strategically. Instead of setting their budget and dividing it by 12 per month, which is what we did, uh, you really look and think about when do you spend more, when do you spend less, how are your allotments set up, and that's one way that we can get at fixing this really critical management tool that if we do this, we can make a lot of things better. And then, um, the second one is uh, trying to find, this is a address at least one finding from the most recent official audit of the city. So the audit finds failings, right? It does, should, your audit should find places where you can perform better. The city has had a practice of just not addressing audit findings. And uh, that's a bad choice. And so what we said is, we're going to make sure that every year we address a different audit finding. These are big, significant issues that if you address an audit finding, you can make major improvements in other part of the city. So I'm going to show you one other and give you an example, and then leave time for Lou. 
but he told me I needed just to. Just a minute. I just said a minute, right? Okay. I want to show you, because the one that I think is worth seeing, oh, it's not going to want to go down. Oh, I know, I can do this. So, what do you think is the, the single biggest complaint that we get in city government today? Snow removal. Uh, well, in the winter it was. In the winter it was. You're right. That would be roads. It's, it's potholes. It's the single biggest complaint. Uh, uh, Thankfully, that's the worst. <laughs> I mean, you're not talking about crime. You're not talking it's the about single thing. Oh, you're talking about the road wet Road conditions. Road conditions are the single biggest. We we get it, it's everywhere. It's all the time. It's constant, constant, constant. Potholes, in particular, in the spring. You know, massive complaints. You deal with it all the time. It consumes a lot of our time. We did not set our goal to fix potholes fast. And some people would say, "Well, why would you do that? Darn it! That's a good thing. Measure that. That's what you should do." Well, um, we think we can measure at a higher level that will achieve potholes, and we can measure this. We can report it with real data. We can say that 95% of city services we deliver will be delivered by their established resolution time. So we have a, it, it says in our, uh, in our policies that we'll fix every pothole within five days of when it is announced, or when it's reported to us. And we do that now at something like 61% of the time. I can't remember what it is. Actually, if I, we're lucky, I maybe mean, I can get us to click on one of these. Here we go. What you'll see is, uh, let's see, uh, drill down. Drill so down. when you drill down into this, uh, number of times addressed is a problem. Let's go to here. 95% of city services will be delivered by their reported resolution. Now, currently, we do this 75% of the time. We look at Potholes, so if you're looking up here at this one, there are a number of measures that make up this, this uh, 75%. We're at 57%. Potholes will be filled by May 15th or within five business days. The baseline today, we're at 57%. Water main breaks will be repaired within 24 hours. Baseline is 100%. We just in our last meeting, we said, we gotta change that. 24 hours is too easy. We're doing it 100% of the time. We got it, and that's what the mayor said. Mayor said, "Why do I have a measure I can do 100% of the time? Either get that out and put something else in harder, or turn that into 12 hours, because we don't need 100% measures today." That's a that's a tough one. I've worked on. I know. That is, that's, that's pretty good. Isn't it? No, it's You're not doing good, really. Yeah, water road cuts will be permanently restored within one year. You can see that if you if you have the time to go and look at this site, in each case. There's a drill down capability that lets you find out with real data how are we doing. 84%. So we want to get our building permits issued within the established time frame 95% of the time. How are we doing on that? There's specific, I can look at this table. I think if I click on this table. Would you like this class to go another half an hour? Uh, no. Yes. No, I need to get yes. back to work. But uh, <laughs> this is great. And that's right, it is, well, it, it's important to be here. Um, in each one of these categories, based on live data from our city systems, uh, some cases it's live, other cases it's updated weekly. I shouldn't misrepresent that. This data is uploaded weekly, and in some cases it's based on live databases. You can find out how we do it on code violations by the comply by date. We want to increase the compliance. This is a really important measure. Increase the compliance on code violations by the comply by date from 20% to 35%. So we struggle here, right? We Getting people to comply on code violations in the time we need them to is hard because they just ignore it. The court process is overloaded. Uh, it's slow, it's cumbersome. People ignore their bills. We can't put it on their tax bills, although we can now and we will. Uh, so we think we're going to make huge progress on the path from today. 19% red, not good. The city just started a Bureau of Administrative Adjudication. In some cities, it's called a Municipal Violations Bureau. And what the Bureau of Administrative Adjudication is going to let us do is take all of these code violations, and instead of processing them through the regular city court system, they're going to go to our Bureau of Administrative Adjudication in an office at City Hall, and we're gonna process them faster and at lower cost and be able to send out a bill to make you pay that bill. And if you don't pay that bill, it's gonna get applied on your taxes. 
because the state just allowed us to do that. And so we're going to get this number better. And, and, and when we do this, you're going to see neighborhoods start looking a lot better. The problem in our neighborhoods, I've heard the mayor say a number of times, and I didn't live in the city to see this, and now I walk, I run in the city every day, it's one of the reasons living there is important. It only, to, actually, you all may have lived in a neighborhood, maybe at some point you've lived in a neighborhood where this happens. It takes one house yep. to lose a street. Yep. It takes one house for somebody to start selling drugs or not paying in their house. Interesting. It takes one house, that's all it is, or abandoning, yep. and you lose a street fast if you don't find a way to create compliance. The mayor has a zombie house on his street in the city. Oh. Zombie house is one where they pay their taxes, but they don't live there and they don't pay, care for it. We are powerless on the zombie house. It's the worst scenario because they pay their taxes. I can't take it from them. So at the bottom of his street, the mayor deals with a zombie house. And he, and he, is, he is living that worry of, does it trickle to the next? And I have a family on Vine Street in the city that calls me several times a week because the owner of a house across the street has allowed other people to live there with him and they are involved in illegal activities and he allows it and it's very difficult for a police organization in the city to stop that when what you really need is to sit an officer there for days at a time. We don't have officers to sit for days at a time in a place where there's no crime going on at that moment. It takes one house. And so these issues are really important to turn the city around. Thank you.